Hey, it's Rob Potash, and welcome to episode number 11 of isokinetics101.org. Uh, our two speakers are John Isomoto and Daniel Bodkin. This is episode 11, uh, 11 in a row. Well done, guys. Very strong. Uh, side note, uh, someone had reached out to us and asked if Daniel or John were available for presentations locally at their location, and they are. So if you're interested in having some expertise, on isokinetics at your location, be it around the world, anywhere in the world, um, they'll consider it. Just send us an email, we'll pass it along, and you can set it up directly with either John or Daniel. With that, Daniel and John, it's your show, so make us proud. All right. Thanks, John, Rob. how you doing? Doing well, Daniel. How about yourself? Doing great. Any uh, travels lately on your end? Um, I was over in the Bahamas, just kind of checking out the Grand Bahama Island to see what was uh, really happening um, from a standpoint that we might be able to help out with some things that's going on over there. But uh, yeah, it's still pretty devastating. So got back last oh, yeah. beginning of this week and taking off um, next week. Okay. Well, uh, that's good. All and right. you're stuck at home with, with sick babies. That's yeah. what I heard. <laughs> yeah. One after another. There you and, go. And the boss, she got it. I've somehow not uh not gotten any of it yet so there you go beautiful don't know how all right so let's go ahead and get started john we'll, we'll wipe out our uh, webcams all right so tonight's episode what we're going to do we're going to continue with the lower extremity i i talked a little too long last month and never got to the ankle so we're going to finish up with the ankle plan of care and then go directly into shoulder. Like us on Facebook. I haven't gotten too many likes, people. Don't tell me that you're not liking me on Facebook, so give me a little follow. <laughs> Check out CSMI while you're there. Email questions to Rob. Uh, he does share those questions with me, and lots of times he'll just send that email directly to me, so if you have a question, um, even if it's something uh, you, know, you think that's small and silly, send it to Rob, and we'll, uh, we'll connect. That way we can get some good uh, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation as well. Always uh, make sure you check out cybextest.org, register your clinic for free. That way patients and doctors can find you and know to send patients to you. Always catch up on your uh, previous episodes. We've had a, a good amount of people that have followed us from episode one all the way to 11. We've had a few people drop in here and there. You know, They maybe watch the isokinetic test video or they watch the uh, isometric training video. Well, tonight, just like last month, we're gonna talk about a lot of these subjects briefly, and we're gonna refer you back to those um, very in-depth uh, episodes. And you can find all those at isokinetics101.org and check out CSMI Solutions for any of your isokinetics needs. I wanna give a good shout out here to Eric Mayer and J.W. Matheson at PT Inquest. Uh, just listened to their most recent podcast yesterday while I was homesick with uh, the youngest one. Uh, they do a great job. They, they, uh, they're really big proponents of isokinetics um, as well as you know, a well-rounded uh, physical therapy approach. All right, so in the past, uh, you know, starting back in January, we covered the history and science in episode one. Episode two was kind of a program preview. And now that we've discussed each of these different topics, it, you know, go back and watch episode two again. Because we got a lot of questions early on that, you know, whoa, this is a lot of information in a very, you know, small uh, time, you know, that one hour. And that was the point. It was to give you a preview. Now you can go back after watching these other episodes and you can kind of follow along and you'll have a good feel for each of those. Uh, and then the next episodes, we took you through passive mobility. Episode four was isometric stability, isokinetic strength, and then isotonic control. Then we hit episodes seven, eight, and nine with testing, uh, isometric, and then two on isokinetic. Again, last month we did uh, lower extremity where we talked about the knee and ACL plan of care. And like I said, we're going to hit the shoulder and uh, ankle tonight. And then we're also going to go into next month where I want to show you some BFR applications. And I'm not going to give you a full BFR blood flow restriction uh, lecture. But if you have blood flow restriction training in your clinic and you have an isokinetic device, it kind of shows you some of the applications you can use for that. And then John, uh, John and I, and primarily John, he's going to go through and give you a good overall program review. So let's go right into foot and ankle uh, plan of care. 
So for your non-surgical ankles, um, we'll get into your uh, a couple surgery cases, but for your non-surgical ankle patient, uh, when they come in on their first day, you know, do your initial examination, and then you can determine what kind of testing is appropriate for them. And remember, you don't have to do this on that first day. Um, typically, we like to do that on the second day. Um, but you know, you can get a good uh, feel of where they are from your initial evaluation, then you can get them into a test that we have a good baseline. So patients that are not appropriate for testing, these are your acute ankle, uh, foot ankle injuries. They're, they're inflamed, so maybe it's not acute, but you know, they're to do a grade two ankle sprain, and that joint is just still really painful and inflamed. If their weight bearing is tolerated or less, and they have moderate pain with manual muscle testing, don't test them, or if the patient is apprehensive. Um, now, if you have a patient that's uh, appropriate for isometric testing, they're gonna be weight bearing is tolerated or greater, they're gonna have minimal to no pain with manual muscle testing, uh, and they're gonna have most likely the, the reduced pain-free active range of motion. Um, now, if you have a patient comes in, they're full weight bearing, they only have some irritation with either higher functional or athletic activity, and they have pain-free range of motion and manual muscle testing, you can go ahead and put them on an interrupted stroke isokinetic test. All right, your patients are gonna fall into three categories. They're gonna be passive training, isometric training, or eccentric training. And the majority of your patients, you know, ankle patients are gonna come and they're gonna be in that passive or isometric uh, phases. So for your passive patients, again, anybody that lacks full uh, pain-free active or passive range of motion, these are your acute injuries or sometimes your non-acute grade two ankle sprains. Uh, your interventions here, you're going to do inversion and eversion pattern uh, and or the dorsiflexion plantar flexion uh, pattern in supine. Um, your goals are to increase the range of motion to within normal limits. Um, so you're going to do that by doing slow passive range of motion, one to five degrees per second maximum. It's a small range of motion with the ankle, so you're not going to want to take them 10, 15, 20 degrees per second in passive. They're not going to like that. Your goal for this patient is to progress them into isometric training. So your isometric training patients, you know, these are your patients who are able to produce torque isometrically in a limited uh, portion of the range of motion. You know, you may or may not have tested them initially. You know, they may have been moved up from passive, um, or you may have done a test on them. Uh, there's also your non-acute ankle injuries. If they have swelling, that's okay. We know that those ankle uh, sprains, they tend to swell and they stay swollen just with gravity. So it's okay for them to be swollen, but you don't want it to be actively inflamed. Um, this is also ideal for your Achilles tendinopathy patients. Uh, with them, we like to do multi-angle isometrics. We start them in the neutral position for both inversion, eversion, and the dorsiflexion plantar flexion pattern. We like to increase from neutral five to 10 degrees at a time in each direction until they've reached their end of the range of motion or it's no longer pain-free. Um, there's no reason to have that ankle into extreme end ranges. Let's say you have um, an adolescent female who is generally hypermobile. Um, there is no reason to work that, uh, those ankle everters with that ankle inverted all the way 50 to 60 degrees. That, that doesn't make sense. So you know, just keep within a normal physiologic range of motion. Now with them, you're gonna start off at 25% effort. You can increase it to 50% effort as they're able. Um, just like with the knee that we've talked about before and what you'll see with the shoulder, you're gonna do between uh, you know, one to five repetitions in each isometric position before it moves on. Um, now, for your Achilles tendinopathy patients, um, you know, there's great research that was done on patellar tendinopathy using low hold, heavy resistance uh, isometrics. You know, we're talking you know, 40 second uh, uh, holds or even 20 second holds but with this, you have to be able to do 85% of your maximal volitional contraction. So, uh, you know, if hitting 85%, again, you put them on a test, an isometric test. Find out what their 100% maximal contraction is. Now you have a target for your patellar, uh, sorry, your Achilles tendinopathy patients uh, to reduce that pain. The goals for your isometric patients is to progress them to an isokinetic patient. Again, your patients are now able to produce torque throughout the range of motion, and lots of times they're progressing from isometric training. Sometimes you'll have a patient that'll come in that you know, just has that lingering ankle pain. They're able to 
you know, uh, they were able to kind of get themselves through the first few phases um, without coming to therapy, but they can't quite shake it off. They can start on isokinetic training. But like I said, most of your, um, your ankles that are walking in the door, those are going to be your uh, CPM or your passive or uh, isometric patients. Uh, your interventions with your isokinetic patients, slow to medium speeds only. Uh, with the, the knee last month and also with the shoulder we'll talk about, you can go into you know, faster speeds, but it's a small range of motion. Um, you don't have that much time to react eccentrically to a fast speed and a small range of motion. So we start slow speeds, five degrees per second, and then you can increase the medium speeds. I'm going to go over the speeds and how we've uh, talked about that, but if you're unfamiliar with it, go back to... Um, to episode five, where John talked about isokinetic training. Uh, you can do light isotonics with some of that dynamic feedback that we talked about in episode six uh, for your proprioception training. So your interactive line and path, your games, um, some of the response time. The big key with isokinetic and with your isotonics is don't work them into extreme end ranges, especially with isokinetics. Remember, we're loading eccentrically. We're not hitting that concentric portion. Uh, the ankle does not like to be loaded eccentrically into the end ranges. Uh, this is a flashback to episode five. How do we pick the speeds when I talked about slow versus medium speeds? So our example here, uh, if we have one degree per second for every degree in the range of motion. So the example of an ankle, if you have 10 degrees of eversion and 30 degrees of inversion of pain-free range of motion that you're exercising, that's only 40 total degrees. So a slow speed would be half the, uh, half the uh, speed of the total range. So 20 degrees per second or less. Your medium speed is one half to two times. So 20 degrees per second to 80 degrees per second. Remember, 40 degrees of range. Uh, your fast speeds, we're going up to 80 degrees per second or faster. So with ankles, stay away from those fast speeds. That's too fast to load that ankle eccentrically. This is another flashback here. We know that if we're loading uh, concentrically, fast, those fast concentrics or even slow concentrics, that's low torque. Once we get to isometric, you can get a medium torque capacity. It's when you get into slow and then fast eccentrics that you can get the highest torque capacity. So remember, it's not just mass, it's also the acceleration. So you can work the acceleration or those speeds faster and faster. Um, without having to load the torque higher and higher, and you still get um, a progression with your exercise. Uh, either way, whether they're um, isometric patient or isokinetic patient, every four weeks when you're doing a progress note or a discharge, do a repeat testing. Um, a lot of your patient that you tested isometrically initially, they might be appropriate for that interrupted stroke isokinetic test um, if they've been working into eccentric training. All right, now we're going to go into um, a surgical ankle uh, plan of care, and I'm going to use the Achilles tendon here. Um, now, your first, well, you know, week one or week zero and week one, don't touch them with the machine. Um, do your normal interventions that you would do. You're not going to start working them on the dynamometer until their second and third week. And all you're doing is CPM for uh, dorsiflexion plantar flexion. The key here is you cannot take them past neutral or zero degrees of dorsiflexion. Now, the, uh, the HUMAC norm has two positions. Um, you know, some of the other machines, your Biodex, your Kincom, they'll have different positions. Um, but the HUMAC norm has, or your old Cybexes will have two positions. Um, start them out in that top picture there, in the supine position with the knee flexed. That's going to uh, take some of the tension off the gastroc, uh, gastroc and the Achilles tendon. So you can work that range of motion without loading that tendon aggressively. And after a few weeks of that, and then you can move into that uh, second uh, picture on the bottom, which is prone. In this position, their knee is extended. So you can get more tension through that Achilles tendon, uh, still only taking them to neutral. Um, but So you have a great progression without going beyond that neutral position. Now, around week six to eight, this is when you can begin multi-angle isometrics for the plantar flexors. Um, and again, do not load them beyond zero degrees of dor dorsiflexion. The key with this is start them in a shortened position. So with that foot, uh, foot and ankle plantar flex, they're still only going to, you know, we're only working the plantar flexors. We're not working the dorsiflexors. Um, 
So having them work with their foot plantar flex, you know, one to five, you know, contractions at five seconds each before the machine moves them. And again, you can load your um, your your angles every 10 to 20 degrees. If I have a patient exercising at 20 degrees in that plantar flex position, I have a 10 degree overlap in either direction. So you don't need to do every five degrees with this. You know, every 10 to 20 degrees is perfect. But again, do not go beyond that zero degree neutral. Um, in the same time, you can all start, also start working multi-angle isometrics for your inverters and everters. Again, start in a shortened position that is pain-free and work them towards that elongated position and keep it pain-free. Um, the key with all of these is that you, you're doing 25% loading the first couple times you do it, and then you can work them up to 50%. This is not about how much torque you can produce. It's about producing torque and controlling it. Um, around week six to eight, uh, oh, sorry, I, I got ahead of myself here. So this, this slide just says what I mentioned, 25 to 50% maximum effort, three to five reps in each position. And you have that 10 degree uh, carryover in each position. Here's just a picture of the uh, multi-angle isometrics for the everters. You can also start doing some isotonic control training. Here you can see I have uh, breakout on the screen. Um, you can do response time, interactive path or line, pong and breakout. These are great for ankle proprioception and we know exactly how important regaining that proprioception is. Um, think about it, you're not going to have your Achilles tendon repair jumping on a BOSU ball <laughs> this early in the rehab. So this is a very safe, controlled way of getting that ankle control and proprioception going um, early on in the process. Just don't put any additional load on it. Um, with, even without any weight, you're doing a lot of repetition back and forth. Um, it's not like the, the adapter itself is not heavy for this, but just start with no weight. And even when they're further along in the, in the rehab, um, you're not gonna load much weight into the ankle with this. Uh, around week nine to 10, you can start doing some slow eccentric loading. And again, go back to what your range of motion is. If you have, we're just gonna say 40 degrees of total motion, slow speeds is half of that or less, so up to 20 degrees per second. So go back to those velocity rules that we talked about. Always start 25% effort, build to 50. Um, you can work your plantar flexors. Again, I like to start everything out in the uh, supine position and then go to prone. The nice thing about that supine position as well is your patient can see the screen where in that prone position, it's they can't. Um, so they're not getting that good feedback. Uh, the inverters, the everters, same thing. Got to hit that. Um, you don't want to neglect those. Um, you know, you're working with the Achilles tendon. They get back to their sport. And now they have a, a grade two ankle sprain because you never worked them centrically or got that control back. So make sure you're working the, that plane of motion with the ankle. Around uh, the same time, you can start adding some light resistance to the isotonic, isotonic control. You can have your patients progressing their eccentric loading to 75%. And around week 16, this is a great time to get an isometric test. Um, not only for the plantar flexion, absolutely. You gotta see what the, the strength is of that, um, that Achilles tendon, gastroc soleus, but also get, get a good baseline of their inverters and everters around week 16. As they progress through the next few months, take their speeds up to those medium speeds, and around week uh, 20, around five months or so, get a good interrupted stroke test for inversion and eversion. Now, you can do an interrupted stroke test for the plantar flexors. I typically keep that isometric. Um, I, I just feel that, you know, uh, no matter how good you are stabilizing them, uh, the, you know, it's hard not to slide uh, on the table when you are or eccentrically loading the plantar flexor. And I think right here that the isometric test for your, your calf at Achilles tendon is a fantastic test uh, as is. But I really like getting that interrupted stroke test for the inverters and everters. Okay, now we're gonna move on to our shoulder uh, plan of care. So if I didn't talk so much last month, this is where we would have been starting in the first place. Now, I'm gonna start out with the surgical plan of care and I'm, I'm gonna use a rotator cuff repair I was gonna do the rotator cuff and the slap repair, um, but it was just gonna take too much time. I also promised you guys that I was gonna do a brostrum uh, repair for the ankle, 
but just running short of time, uh, didn't get to that. So for your rotator cuff, and really for your slaps too, um, when you're prehabbing that patient, uh, whether you know they're going to have surgery or they're in your, your clinic, you're trying to progress them through without having to have surgery, um, you know, multi-angle isometrics and the slow eccentrics, so long as it's pain-free and it doesn't flare up the shoulder, is a great prehab to get that, uh, that cuff tendon thickened, get it a little bit stronger. Um, now, once they have surgery, in your first six weeks, whether it's a rotator cuff, small, medium, large, a slap, one, two, three, or four, um, or just, you know, the doctor has a specific protocol, you're going to follow your range of motion limitations. And lots of times your doctor is going to give you a very specific protocol. If not, you can find so many really good um, evidence-based um, uh, rehab protocols online. Um, so I'm, again, I'm going to mainly cover rotator cuff, but slap, you're going to have a lot of the same progressions, but the, time, the weeks might be a little bit different and the range of motion in that first phase is gonna be different. So typical range of motion, I'm using medium tears. Uh, this came from a few different protocols that are out there. So I just kind of summarized it. Your first week, you're gonna have them working their CPM or their passive flexion up to 90 degrees or their tolerance. Their ER and IR passive range of motion, we want that in the scapular plane. You can typically take them up to about 35 degrees. In your second week, you're gonna increase that flexion up to from 105 to up to 125. Again, go on tolerance. Their ERIR, you can take them up to 35 to 45 degrees. Now, over the course of this first phase, your goal is to get full passive range of motion. And one thing I want you to think of is uh, the positions that we're gonna do it and, and how also the joint axis changes um, on the machine. Or sorry, the, the axis of rotation changes with the shoulder as it moves but the axis of rotation stays the same on the machine. So um, let's go into these positions. And John, I'd like to, I want you to unmute yourself if you can, because you're gonna give us some really good insight on these different positions. Maybe. <laughs> so John, I want you to describe the setup that uh, we see here. Uh, really, it's it's a beginning setup. So if, if anybody's having some apprehension we, we like to kind of start them in, in a sitting position. You know, they're kind of used to being in a sling with their arm down next to their side. You know, we can maintain that. And that's one of the reasons that when you pay attention to where the pad placement, it becomes very important. You don't want that pad placement at a very distal area. You want it kind of proximal to the, just proximal to the shoulder. And you want to be able to move this in a very slow, gentle progression. So again, if we're really talking about uh, working upwards to 90 degrees, we would start with that axis of rotation right at the acromion, and we would kind of slowly bring that up at five degrees or less to where the patient's tolerance is, and then we could slowly increase it to 90 degrees. I like sitting as one of my first positions. The other one that I might use would be a, a supine position, but sitting is ideal. Uh, patient can kind of see what's going on. Yeah. Talk to me about, are, do you have them in a pure flexion or are they slightly abducted or in scaption at all? You know, I, I, I like to keep them in a straight plane position, but typically you're going you're gonna to find that they're just in a, a little bit of a uh, abducted position of, of maybe only five to 10 degrees okay. uh, to, to what feels very comfortable for them so that they're not working across their body. We're not bringing them in the adduction at all. We want to keep them in a straight plane and we want to kind of keep them, you know, if anything, moving just into a, a slight amount of abduction in, in that zone. Fantastic. All right, let's move on to the next position. So here we have supine flexion. Uh, talk to me about some of the advantages and disadvantages of this one here. Well, supine has a couple of different points uh, that you have to make. And really, it becomes important for us to recognize how we're attaching the patient to the machine. And it's things that we kind of talked about before. If you don't have that range of motion set, so that axis rotation, axis rotation, you may get a little distraction through the range of motion. The ideal mm -hmm. about, thing about supine is that, you know, the position should be one that allows you to have compression uh, so that as we move through that, not a great deal of compression, but we're not actually putting attraction stretch on those healing tissues. We don't want that to occur. No. So, so it's extremely important that axis of rotation to the axis of rotation um, 
occur and that we're working in that in a very comfortable zone. Uh, the other position with this, again, is that you know, the patient can kind of let us know if there's any issues. They're kind of looking around. We can see their face. So we know if there's an issue that they might be having. One of the disadvantages here is the patient does have to hold that grip adapter. So this isn't something you're gonna do in your first one to two weeks when, you know, they're gonna be limited in their ability to hold onto that adapter for, you know, five to 10 minutes at a time. Um, and also I wrote on here, you can work the entire range of motion comfortably but remember, as that joint or as that axis rotation changes in the shoulder, um, so you know you want to keep. If you're going to work above 90 degrees here, you're going to go slightly less than 90, but maybe up to 125. If you're looking to work in range of the shoulder, maybe take them from 125 into 160 degrees. I don't recommend going all the way from 40 degrees by their side all the way up to 160 degrees with them in this. Oh, I agree 100%. You know, work them in the stages, and that's one of the key components. You know, it should be a gradual progression that we're kind of bringing everybody up through those range of motion. So we might only work a 30 to 50 degree range of motion that's that's going to be very comfortable for them. And again, we're always, if we go back, like you keep you keep mentioning to them, if we go back and we talk about how we set these things up, we always passively take them through the range mm -hmm. of motion, you know, um, before we even tie them into the machine to make sure that there's no restriction, there's no difficulties yeah. with anything they're going to be doing. I mean, I, I can even manually mobilize their shoulder for a few minutes to loosen them up, get them to relax, kind of talk to them, find out how they're doing. And then I know their range and they're, they're relaxed. Um, then I can set them up on the machine. So you can do that right there on the table. Yeah, and the beautiful beautiful thing with this, just one more point, is that yeah. you can add a little strap to kind of help them with the grip, but then you can also add some of your other um, areas. So if you got a lot of swelling, if you want to do a, uh, instrument assisted soft tissue, um, it's a great it's a great position because you're moving through a relatively small range of motion very slowly. Mm -hmm. So you could actually do some flushing massage um, with your instrument assisted techniques. I think I had that in my slide on the ankle passive, you, um, yeah. but I didn't mention it. I was I, honestly, I was watching the uh, the Colts Titans football game. Actually, I'm not. I'm thinking about it though. Well, the Colts are on right now, Daniel. If, if <laughs> I know. It's, it's the Colts and Texans. Got to got to get back on top of that AFC South. All right. John, next, we have the prone position. Um, if you could talk to me about this one a little bit here. I love prone. Um, you know, in, interesting enough, one of, one of the advantages of prone is it actually allows for us to get a little bit of a distractional technique kind of going in. Again, remember that pad placement. We're kind of moving it a little distally from the elbow at this point, so you can kind of see that. But the elbow is still being being rested on that fairly comfortably. Um, and the, the patient should be in a very comfortable position. So axis rotation, again, axis rotation absolutely phenomenal if you've got an impingement, adhesive capsulitis, also allows us to kind of work manually on the scapular platform. Uh, and a, a lot of these young ladies that you're seeing are, are members of, uh, of our softball team and our coaches, you know, the coach for the USA uh, softball team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's see, let's move now. Here we have ERIR in the standing position. And we're gonna go into the scapular plane in a couple slides from now, John. But, um, so we're gonna discuss that there, but tell me a little bit about why you would work passively in this position. Uh, so again, one of the biggest issues that we're looking for, and one of the reasons that we would want to do it is the same reasons for joint mobilizations. Um, if we're working flexion, we know that because it's, uh, the distal end of the joint is convex, it's going to glide in the opposite direction, so of bone movement. So if we're going into flexion, the head of the humerus is going to glide inferiorly, just like if we were going to mobilize. So we want to make sure that we're getting the soft tissue and the capsular restraints working well in a very gentle range of motion. So again, with external rotation, we're going to start to put a little bit of stress to the anterior capsule, internal rotation, a little bit of stress to the posterior capsule. We're gonna make sure the soft tissue is working, that we have the range of motion, that everything is comfortable before we start any type of resistive exercises. Mm -hmm.
And I want everybody to be aware, there are many different other patterns you could work E-R-I-R in. Um, they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, but just be aware, you know, and each machine is different, but there are a lot of great uh, positions that you can work these patients in. All right, so around, uh, back to our, our protocol, around week six of our rotator cuff repair, we can start working multi-angle isometrics for the external rotators. We wanna do it in a, uh, the pain-free range of motion. We wanna start in the neutral position. And what I mean by neutral, they're gonna be in that scapular plane that we're gonna go over, but you're starting them in zero degrees of ERIR. Um, and then you can increase out 10 to 20 degree increments in both directions. Let's say they get to, you know, they're at 40 degrees of external rotation. Um, they're not able to produce torque into the pad because remember for multi-angle isometrics, they, they're going to have to produce a, a light torque into that pad or force into that pad. So let's say they either don't have the strength there or it's uncomfortable. You can always just, you know, rest the hand on top of the pad and have them do liftoffs. So they're being held in that 40 degree position and then they're just lifting the weight of the arm up off that pad, holding for five seconds and relaxing down. Um, either way, uh, you're only looking for one to two pounds of external load here. You do not want to load that heavily. Um, and John, if you're still with me, it's a great segue into the eccentric unloading for the shoulder. Right. And and one thing that I'll mention that, that I like to do is that uh, I'll do a two to one um, position as far as um, going into external rotation versus internal rotation. So meaning yeah. that if we start neutral, if I go 10 degrees in external rotation, I'll move them five degrees in internal rotation. Because what I want to make sure is that when we start to cause any resistance, and even lengthening might cause a little resistance, uh, that's where we're going to get the most tension or irritation to that uh, beginning repair. We're going to be moving through that range, but we want to make sure that it's it's very comfortable and we're not doing it overly aggressive. So if I move them up um, you know, to 20 degrees, in external rotation, I'll go 10 degrees internal rotation for a 30 degree range of motion total. That's a great point. You know, the same torque applied to that tendon in a shortened position versus an elongated pretensed is a completely different. Uh, uh, Puppy all together. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right, here we have the active exercise per position for the uh, rotator cuff. John, talk to me about the scapular plane for exercise. Well, you know, the advantage is we always want to find the optimal position to be able to activate the rotator cuff. So, you know, when we talk about the joint, we talk about resting positions. But when we talk about muscles, we often talk about, you know, what's the ideal position for active myosin overlap that you can actually generate? Do you want to put them in their weakest position when they're, you know, first coming out of surgery or having some, you know, acute injury? Hopefully not. We want to put them in the optimal position where they could generate the most strength or be able to generate strength in the beginning position. And the scapular plane kind of hits that in both ways. You know, it's one of the reasons a lot of docs want to put them into an airplane splint if they've got a massive rotator cuff. So again, it's about 45, 55 degrees of abduction, 30 degrees of horizontal adduction. It kind of lines the humerus in plane with the scapula. So the rotator cuff is, is aligned in a little bit better position. So it, again, great resting position, and it moves us out of that avascular zone that you and I know so much about. You know, when you're, you see everybody kind of starting in that sideline position with the elbow right next to the side, but when you really look at the, the blood flow to the rotator cuff, there's actually a little bit of an avascular zone when your arm is down next to your side. Absolutely. Okay, moving on, in around week eight, you know, if you think about where we're getting a lot of these timelines, you gotta think about collagen tissue healing times. So around week eight, we're starting to get some good healing going on. So we can begin our slow eccentric loading. Um, remember, when you're writing your protocols for, for your eccentric isokinetic loading, you're gonna write that protocol as a CPM. If you go back to last month, uh, episode 10, I did a video and it talked about actually setting up at CPM. That way, uh, during that concentric phase, patient can sit back and relax and it lifts their arm for them and only exercise in the eccentric phase. If you set it as isokinetic, that patient is gonna have to produce torque, even just one pound, 
all right? We know that when you start hitting the concentric, you're increasing that oxygen demand tremendously. So they're gonna fatigue out, so you're not gonna get as many good eccentric reps in that set. Um, so set it up as a CPM again. Only one to two pounds of torque we're looking for. We're not looking for high torque here. Um, and also keeping your speeds low. So go back to that, um, that formula that John's created about your slow eccentric speeds, half of the range of motion or less. You can also start your isotonic training um, that I showed you or I mentioned for the ankle is your interactive path and line, the, the roadway pacing bar, the games. Um, this is great because you're not loading it heavy. And remember that the, they're having to already lift the weight of their arm. They're having to lift the, the little bit of weight of the adapter. Um, so it's not heavy, but they're already having a small external load. The point of the games is, yes, you get some good proprioception. It's not as important for the shoulder as it is for like the knee or the ankle after surgery, but it's, it's, they're controlling multiple directions, multiple speeds, and you're, you're, you're having them go for minutes, you know, a minute, two minutes on end. So it's fantastic for getting that uh, early endurance training for the shoulder. Around week 10 to 12, for again, for your shoulder patients, this is a good time to start bringing in some eccentric loading for the elbow, uh, for specifically the pronator teres and wrist flexor mass. Uh, you do not wanna have one of your shoulder patients go back to baseball after working nine months to a year and then come back to you, you know, five months later with the Tommy John issue. So uh, the machine is ideal and uh, I we ran out of time on episode five just like me, John loves to talk, especially with eccentric. So we ran out of time, so we didn't get to the videos for that. So I threw it up on my YouTube channel. Um, check that out. Just type that address into um, your internet browser. It'll come to my YouTube channel. It's only a five-minute video, but it shows eccentric loading and progressions for the shoulder, elbow, wrist, forearm, and ankle. Um, and you can see this young man here. He was one of our pitchers. He was actually doing uh, – he had a Tommy John repair. And if you look closely at his elbow, you can see that pronator Terry is firing pretty aggressively, and he's doing an eccentric loading program for that. Um, John, can you also come back on as well right now, please? Sure. Talk to me about, um, well, just quickly, we're not going to go into a Tommy John protocol, but talk to me a few things about our elbow patients and, you know, implementing shoulder and, you know, advances that we've had. Gosh, I, I love elbows, and you know we we saw so many throwers, so many pitchers, so many different professional levels, and so many teams sent them to us. And you know we had an opportunity to work with the Yankees pretty aggressively, you know here in Tampa. Um, Tommy Johns has been a just eliminating so many of our great throwers because of one problem or the other. But one thing that we we really notice, especially with a lot of our younger uh, athletes, the, those kids who are throwing at 12, 14, 16, um, and they're and they're they're only playing one sport, so they're throwing all year long. Is that one of the things that we find is that when they have weakness of their scapular stabilizers in their shoulders, then they start to actually drop their shoulder. When they drop their shoulder, they they lead with the elbow. They lead with the elbow. They open them up on the medial aspect. So now you have two problems. I mean, it, like we see with a lot of things. Now you've got an injury to the medial aspect of the elbow, but if we do everything we need to do to bring that elbow back, but we haven't addressed why they got that problem in the first place, which is going to be weakness, in the deceleration phase of the rotator cuff and the scapular platform, then we haven't done them the services that we actually need to. So it becomes really important for us to make sure that we do all those. And that actually includes, remember that that bicep is a very aggressive high-speed decelerator. And it becomes important for us to recognize that. Absolutely. And there's a great bicep eccentric loading video on that YouTube link right there. Uh, talk to me about a, a recent uh, advance in Tommy John surgery we were so, discussing well, earlier. Throw, throw a big shout out to a good friend of mine, Chris Arrigo, uh, here in Tampa at Advanced Rehab. Uh, Chris has done a lot of work and, and published a, a great deal and has done some marvelous stuff with Dr. Andrews and, and Kevin Wilk. So if you read any of their literature, you, you typically have a tendency to see Chris Arrigo's name up there. So um, – Grab your journal, Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. Go to April 2019, this past year. And then um, 
So there's a new game changer on the horizon that's going to kind of fit with certain people, and we want to see how well this goes. It's called the internal brace surgery uh, for, for medial elbow, and so it's going to give us the opportunity maybe to bring some people, uh, some certain select patients probably back a little bit faster. So we have one pro uh, picture that's kind of completed that. It's kind of going back. We've got a couple other things happening in that. And, and uh, Chris has really led that way. So again, April 2019, Journal of Orthopedic Sports Physical Therapy. Get your hands on rehabilitation, internal brace surgery for a meteor elbow. Certainly. All right, and John, if you can, stay with me here. Now, I, I call this the, the modified Blackburn program. Um, just because that's what a lot of people know the, the you know, the Blackburn ITY as. Um, now, other than eccentric loading, I think this is one of the things that you were known most for in your rehab style. Talk to me about how your um, scapular platform program is different than most that you'll see out there. Yeah, our scapular stabilization program goes back uh, years, actually before uh, Tab actually did his um, his paper on EMG of the posterior rotator cuff. And it was great because it did show us that um, certain aspects of the rotator cuff uh, really had problems in the deceleration or eccentric mode of activities. And he looked at specific positions that um, were great for, for being able to recruit and train rotator cuff to a higher level. Uh, than, than those ones that we were doing. Now, interesting enough, I started my program uh, as a student. I had an opportunity to work with Florence Kendall. So a lot of you may know Florence Kendall from manual muscle tests. So, you know, what muscles do we really want to work when we talk scapular stabilization? I want to bring in middle trapezius and the lower trapezius. I'm not interested in the rhomboids. I don't want to fire the upper trap levator scapula. I want to bring in that middle and lower trapezius. So I want after her muscle test position, which for middle trapezius, 90 degrees abduction, extreme external rotation, and instead of just doing an isometric at that position, what we did is we brought them into elevation, so they went into a short and concentric phase, and then lowered it down again twice as slow in the eccentric phase. We did it at 90, and we did it at 135. 90s for middle trapezius, 135 for lower trapezius. So this is kind of evolved where people talk about doing T's and Y's and even the W's when we do 90-90 um, extra action. rotation. Right. But the aspect is that I really prefer to do this on a, a, uh, a unilateral position because the opposite side is stabilizing. Just like when we talk about we're doing some hip work, your opposite hip is working stabilization when you're lifting one up. Your, your scapular platform has to do the same thing. So a lot of times when we go into 90, what we do is we adduct first and we don't do anything else. So the ideal position for the scapular stabilizers, quite honestly, is to depress the scapula first and then gently adduct them in the position so that we're knocking out the upper trap levator scapular rhomboids and we're isolating middle lower trapezius alone. John, I, I apologize. I left depression adduction off of this, but that's a very big, important key to this. Huge. Yeah. Um, start and that's why they reps, need to listen. Yeah. Higher reps, lower weight. Again, it's about, especially with these uh, patients, it's about endurance of these muscles, not just about how strong you are. And the stronger or the heavier you go, the more you're going to kick in the, the rhomboids, the upper traps. So you don't want to go heavy. Uh, ways I like to progress this. You know, everybody's, I see, you know, walk-in clinics, and uh, therapists are having their patients doing this three, five, ten pounds. Now I'm a strong guy. I can do it in those weights, but I'm, you know, I, that's what I do. I lift heavy things. I pick them up and put them down. But a lot of our athletes that are in the clinic can't. So I see all the time they're they're loading their patients up with weight and they're just kicking in that rhomboid and getting out of those positions. So ways I like to progress this. I like to go on the physio or Swiss ball um, or in the quadruped position. I um. Uh, I'm a big fan of having them do hold a, a isometric bird dog while working that opposite shoulder. That brings it. It's great for bringing in the core, um, bringing in the opposite hip, tying in those diagonal patterns. Um, if they're able to, I love doing it in the plank. I've only had a few patients who've been able to hold the plank and not have the plank uh, ruin the positions they're in. Um, recently, I've gotten uh, been following you know Mike Reinhold and the prehab guys online and. 
I learned, you know, the weighted ball flips for time in these positions uh, on the table. Um, that brings that faster eccentric in, brings that endurance phase as well. Um, now, you can also bring in less reps, higher weight with some of your uh, athletes, so long as they're not losing that ideal position. All right, around week 16, back to our protocol. So you're around week 16 now. So for your active population, um, you can progress them into those medium speed deceleration. Um, and around week 24, we're about six months in, this is where, you know, if you have a pitcher, you're, that they'll still be working with you. Uh, so then they can get into those fast speeds. John likes to work the shoulder typically, you know, 30 degrees of ER to 30 degrees of IR. For his pitcher, he'll open that up a little bit further into external rotation. So, um, you know, if you think you have 60 degrees, uh, your medium speeds are going to take you up to 120. Your fast speeds are going to go 120 and uh, higher. But John, if you could tell me about uh, typically how fast would you ever have any of your pitchers loading in the eccentric or deceleration? You know, and Daniel, that's a great that's a great question because we're really talking about someone who's a incredibly high level trained athlete that has to participate at extreme speeds of deceleration. So we all know of, of the research that out there, when we talk about the, 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 the speeds of deceleration of the rotator cuff, and we're talking about moving through, you know, six, 800 degrees per second. Now, none of the machines are going to kind of be able to match that, but one of the things that we can do is that we can actually start to change the speed that they're moving from a concentric to a, to an eccentric motion, so it actually gives them a very sudden change uh, of direction, which is exactly what happens when they release the ball. Everything is kind of brought forward to kind of accelerate, and then at one point in the range of motion, they go from acceleration to extreme deceleration all of a sudden. And what we try to do is a set principle. We try to go in and specific adaptations to impose demands. We try to set that same position so that when they release, it's going to be a sudden deceleration, and they're going to start to train the rotator cuff to be able to have that high-speed deceleration as quickly as possible. And now, John, speeds, that's a great segue here. Um, yep. So the top line here, the active eccentric and resting concentric, that's how we've been training it, where they're just completely resting and concentric. But what you just mentioned, uh, that second one down where I'm seeing an active eccentric and concentric, so we're still only working, say, the external rotators but they're working both directions and they're getting that sudden change of direction with that. So they're only working that, not only is they're getting that change of direction, but that concentric phase is now gonna increase the fatigue is now they're having a higher oxygen demand. Um, what kind of speeds are we talking maximally? Uh, would you ever go with any of your, your high level pitchers? And, and again, depending on the range of motion that we're going to, you know, a lot of times we'll talk about two times whatever our range is. So if, if I've got somebody through a 80 degree range of motion, um, you know, we may take them up to 240 degrees. Absolutely. Um, if you go back to episode two in that uh, preview, when I talked about isokinetic training, the very last video, you see one of John's pitchers working on his Kincom. And he was working at 240 degrees per second in that, um, you know, not, they're truly in an isokinetic mode of exercise. So if you want to go back and see what that looks like, uh, you can check that one out. Now, as far as testing of your rotator cuff, you want to keep all your testing isometric at neutral in that scapular plane. Around weeks 12 and 16, you can do an initial and then a follow-up. But around weeks 20 or greater, that's when you can get in that interrupted stroke test. Um, we like to test 60 degrees total, 30 degrees to 30 degrees, and we test both ER and IR. And uh, also for testing, great idea to do preseason testing on all your uh, former patients to see their readiness. That way they don't show up to camp and get an injury. Here I have a, a sample test um, of one of our high school athletes. Um, now we have the notes available for this, so you can go through and look at the numbers, and uh, you know his dominant arm, his injured arm is the right. So if you look at the test on the left, that's his for his external rotators. The test on the right is for his internal rotators. So you can see that his uh, his rotator cuff injury, he was deficient in his external rotators, but his internal rotators were where they should be. Let's go. Let's talk about a few things that we're looking for generally. We want the involved side to be stronger than the uninvolved side by 10 to 15 percent. And when we're talking about the knee or the ankle. 
Um, we usually want the uninvolved side to be, you know, within 10 to 15 degrees. But we know that, especially with throwers, that they're going to have that imbalance. So we actually want that involved side to be stronger than, than the uninvolved. Um, just like with the knee that we've talked about before, we want the eccentric of each to be stronger than the concentric by about 30%. And we look at ratios. Um, if we took ER to IR, but we only looked at concentric to concentric or eccentric to eccentric, we know that the internal rotators are stronger than the external rotators. And John, definitely chime back in on this because you always made this point with our students um, that your internal rotators are gonna be stronger than your external rotators. And it's about that same 0.6 to 0.8 that you see with the quad and the hamstring. But John, talk to me about the functional ratio of the shoulder. So yeah, again, it becomes, it becomes difficult because only if, if you just look at the anatomical uh, musculature that produces internal rotation, you have so many. I mean, you know, the, the subscap has about the same amount of, of um, muscular tension that, that the infraspinatus and teres minor combined do. You, you still got the pectoralis, you still got your anterior deltoid, you still got, you know, so many uh, rhomboids that, 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 can, that can actually affect that, the teres. So there, there's a there's a muscular imbalance between internal and external rotation that exists. The problem with that is that uh, when we start to kind of build into that, if our exercise sequence or our activities depend on us to decelerate at a more aggressive point, if we're not building our rehabilitation program to accept that, they're going to fail when they go back. So a perfect, a perfect example is, think about a weighted medicine ball. If all you ever did, and this is what I see at the gym, all, if all you ever did with a weighted medicine ball was to throw it against the wall and then go pick it up and then throw it against the wall again, and you do that, you've developed a really good functional exercise for throwing that ball. But here's where the problem evolves. Then you go back onto the, quote, field, now someone's throwing the ball at you. It's a totally different environment. You're not doing the concentric, you're, ex you're absorbing that, and you have to be able to decelerate that very aggressively or you're gonna get hurt. Well, yeah, and, and we've had a few uh, lectures where we've looked at, and I love this picture, uh, you know, the car, you know, the powerful oh, motor exactly. and the weak brakes. Yeah, and what's going to happen is if the muscle doesn't respond, you're going to go to the underlying structure. You're, you're going to go to that posterior capsule. You're going to end up with a Bennett's lesion. You're going to have, you know, tears to the rotator cuff. You're going to get, you know, irritation and stretching to the posterior capsule, and you're going to cause additional problems if we don't train them to be functional in their activities. Absolutely. Okay, we are going to stop here. This is actually very short. I could probably finish it up, but we're going to hold up uh, till next month in December where we really quickly run over the non-surgical shoulder. Uh, give you a little preview. It's really similar to the non-surgical knee and the non-surgical ankle that you've already seen. Um, so we'll just pick it up with that. Um, John, let's go ahead and bring your webcam back in. We'll, we'll chat for a moment. Okay. All right. I have to sit up in my chair then. <laughs> Um, great episode, John. And again, you, uh, you've developed all these fantastic pearls. Um, you always said, you know, anybody can push the buttons. Anybody can turn the levers. It's about knowing the science behind the exercise, bringing in all the different uh, elements that you, you've discussed tonight that can really take any viewer watching this who maybe even be familiar with the machine. And now you've just added in all these different elements to make their care of their patients that much greater. And that's exactly why we wanted to do this. And, you know, quite honestly, next month, uh, when we kind of wrap that up, one of the things I hope to be able to do is just kind of uh, walk us through that whole sequence again on everything that we should be doing. So uh, shout out to you, Daniel, because quite honestly, you've kind of taken the lead on developing this, this program and bringing it to more and more people. And so, I would tell anyone if they're looking for someone 
to really train them from an ice kinetic standpoint and a strengthening point is to contact you and make sure that they're they're working with you. On the other point I wanted to mention, I was watching that kid that you worked on um, who plays for Philadelphia Eagles, and the kid yeah. had a phenomenal, phenomenal <laughs> game last 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 month. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's always fun and interesting watching some of those kids kind of evolve Absolutely. and what's going on from that standpoint. So um, I'm looking forward to the next month. It's our it's our ending. Everybody has these mm -hmm. to kind of go back on to. Um, let's you know we can bring Rob back in if he's still there, and uh, we can kind of finish up. Fantastic. He he might be checked out. I'm there he is. But I might not be. <laughs> well done. That was excellent. I think the more you two banter back and forth, the more interesting and engaging the uh, presentation, and just letting you know you gotta work a little harder. But that was fantastic. Well done. Very good. No, very good. And and again, so uh, two points to bring up from from today. Again, you have Daniel's uh, Facebook. Uh, so a great way to be able to contact him and make sure that you can reach out to him. So by all means, we've already had a couple of people who are asking um, for additional information, uh, things that they can do. So uh, get on Daniel's Facebook and try to make contact and let's take care of it. All right. Okay. We'll see everybody next month. All right. Have a good night, guys. Have a great night. Over Thanks. Now.